Our guest today is Dr. Jonathan Clausen, who currently works at Iowa State University as an associate professor in mechanical engineering. Uh, Dr. Clausen spent his undergrad years at the University of Minnesota and has a very interesting double major, a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish and Portuguese. He also attained a master's and PhD from Purdue University and his work and in his work and research career, he has a stop at the U.S. Naval Research Station in Washington, D.C. He's been at Iowa State for the past six years, and today we'll be talking a little bit about his career and his work in nanotechnology with graphene. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon, Dr. Clausen. Thanks for having me, Mark. This is great. I, I appreciate that. Now, 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 going back to your undergraduate days, uh, can you explain that double major? Uh, not many people that I know of uh, go into Spanish and Portuguese and mechanical engineering all at once. Yeah, it, it was kind of unique. Um, I, I took a, a year off from my undergraduate degree to do some service work in Brazil. So I lived in Brazil uh, in the state of Santa Catarina for, for one year and actually learned Portuguese there first, came back to the University of Minnesota. Um, I continued working with uh, the Latin population here in the States and, and that is um, you know just doing some service work with them or helping them translate things and that is in Spanish and Portuguese and Spanish are very close and it ended up being where the University of Minnesota had a, 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 a Spanish slash Portuguese degree where half the classes were taught in Portuguese, half in Spanish and I tested out of all the introductory courses where you actually learn the language. So I was just taking history uh, and literature courses primarily taught in those languages. And it was, it was a good, for me, it was a great break from, the, from all the math of engineering. <laughs> now, was that some type of uh, ministry, some missionary work or? Yeah, it, it was, at, at that time, it was, it was some missionary work. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was a missionary with Campus Crusade for Christ for five years. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, it was through a different organization, but but kind of similar in, in that regards. Yeah. Okay. Well, pretty neat. So, uh, so if you want to talk some Portuguese, you can, but I won't have any idea what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> now it's now I it's, it's primarily Spanish. It's been a while since I've used my Portuguese, but um, I can definitely understand it. <laughs> okay. And uh, you know, you had to stop at the Naval Research Lab. I, a friend of mine who I grew up with. Uh, was a mechanical engineer for Mississippi State, and he also went to work there probably sometime in the 80s, and I, he used to tell me that they would try to find things to burn all day, things that wouldn't burn that they could make Navy ships out of, so I don't, yeah. know, <laughs> I don't know what you can tell us. I don't want to, you know, go into any non-disclosure non things and get the FBI following you or anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, no, it, I, all the things that I worked on were unclassified. So, um, and, and the Naval Research Lab is, is, is pretty large. It's, it feels much like a college university in that they have different departments. And my department was the Center for um, Biological and Molecular Sciences and Engineering. And a lot of us were working on what we call biosensors. That's where we're trying to detect things like nerve agents in, in oh, the okay. field or even cancer biomarkers in a fluid. And, and so I was working uh, on nanomaterials on these things called quantum dots and using them to uh, put an enzyme on them for detection purposes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, in your career, when did you first become aware of graphene or, you know, when did you first hear about it, start working with it, that sort of thing? Yeah, it was probably, you know, well, definitely nanotechnology in general. When I was an undergrad at the University of Minnesota, that was kind of the newer field and, and seemed really interested, interesting. And I was always interested in kind of uh, biomedical applications. I had a, a father that passed away from cancer, a grandmother that had Alzheimer's disease. And I always, I, since those things happened, I, I felt more inclined to go into biomedical or biological research. And and it just kind of coupled together with nanomaterials. And then when I got at Purdue University, that's when we started at that time growing carbon nanotubes. And then shortly thereafter, um, graphene, this 2D material, very similar to carbon nanotubes, became you know more prevalent and we started working with that. <clears throat> okay. And uh, I guess tell us about the, the Clausen Lab there at Iowa State University. Uh, you, did you start that six years ago or is that uh, a more recent thing or? Yep, yep. So that was started right when I, you know, I got on to become a, a, a new assistant professor at Iowa State University in 2014. And so, you know, we went into the research of, of what I knew how to do working with nanomaterials and, and biosensors. And we've kind of now expanded that to doing all different types of printing 
inkjet and aerosol printing of, of these nanomaterials, and that's more of a scalable process um, that, that could be commercialized um, as opposed to some of the older techniques to make these nanomaterials or, or nanomaterial-based circuits. And, and we've also expanded into energy harvesters. So, so things like thermoelectric generators where we can convert heat loss or um, maybe from your body or from, from a car exhaust pipe, for example, and convert that into electricity and, and potentially use that for, for useful energy. <clears throat> okay. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I, I became aware of you through a, a recent news story talking about uh, where you made sensors to help with uh, food inspection. Yeah. So can you yeah. describe that? Tell us more about that project. Yeah, exactly. So in, in that case, we, we uh, aerosol printed a graphene electrode. We functionalized that with an antibody. So an antibody was, was put onto that graphene or conveniently bound to that, anti to that graphene. And then that um, antibody can detect um, different things. So one project you probably saw was we were detecting histamine. Mm -hmm. And that is a colorless and odorless compound, for example, found in fish that when fish spoil, um, that is produced and you can get pretty sick from it. And often the grocery stores throw out their fish, you know, way before that happens. But this would be a way to extend that shelf life to actually know if it's, if it's bad or not, or in a fish market. But we've also have different biorecognition agents, uh, such as a different antibody that can detect salmonella in, in, in food, food products as well. And as we know, salmonella, E. coli, listeria, those types of outbreaks of bacteria have, have been very prevalent in the news throughout the years um, with, with food as well. Okay. And uh, these printers, I mean, that's not some printer you go to Staples and buy. This is a, a printer that you make yourself or I guess yeah. to take, take a basic one and jazz it up? Yeah, yeah. So they're definitely, they're specially designed printers. So you can buy these from, you know, there's, there's only a few companies that make these types of printers. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 they're, they're very different than, they're, they're, they're similar to what, what maybe an inkjet printer that you could, you could buy to, to print inks. But, but they have, you know, what, what we can do though is we can, they have different nozzles and, and, and nozzle diameters. So we can change the ink and the ink viscosity that we put into these printers and we can actually print our nanomaterials. So they're specially designed so we can, we can um, change that and tune that. Okay. Um, and, the, and the inkjet is just making it into a liquid form and printing it and then the aerosol form for an aerosol jet printer to print those as well. <clears throat> okay. And um, with graphene, I mean, I don't, I don't wanna get into any secrets or anything. Is, is that something you create there or you, you purchase graphene from another source and then use it in these, in your research? Yeah. Yeah, we, we've, we've, we've purchased it, we've created it. We've also worked with collaborators who, who create some for us. But the graphene, what's nice about using it in the printing form, it's just chemically exfoliating graphite. And you can do that in a batch process. Uh, it's pretty low cost. And then you have to add um, some binding materials and some solvents to it to make it into an ink formula to print. Um, but what's nice about this, it isn't the pristine graphene that you maybe would grow in a chemical vapor deposition machine that's done in a very high temperature process and a vacuum environment, and that's really expensive. But this is all, you know, just breaking up graphite basically into small nanoflakes and then printing those. And then we do a annealing process to try to somewhat bind those flakes back together so they have pretty high electrical conductivity. Um, and, and it's not as, 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 as doesn't have the same superior properties as pristine CVD chemical vapor deposition grown graphene, but it's, it's good enough for a lot of our, our biosensor applications. And since it's so low cost, cheaper than, than a lot of the metals that you would see in these biosensors, such as gold or platinum, um, it's a really nice, uh, material to work with. Okay. And, uh, within your lab, are, are, is there more graphene type projects that you can talk about? Yeah, absolutely. So beyond that, we're working on some wearable biosensors. So these, these printable uh, graphene electronics are flexible. They can bend and they retain their electrical conductivity. So we've put them onto the skin to measure um, things such as lactate and glucose that could monitor the physical stress that someone's been going through, such as after a workout or an athlete or a soldier, but also hydration ions, looking to see if, if you know, how like potassium, sodium, and other salts 
are changing in the sweat with time so that you know if you need to hydrate or if you're becoming dehydrated. Um, we've also used these printed graphene circuits uh, for ion sensing in soil. So we're looking at fertilizer ions so we can put them onto probes and you know, see how much fertilizer is actually in the soil so a farmer would know if they need to apply more and hopefully they, they can apply only what's needed so there's not runoff or pollution and there's a cost savings there. But we've also looked at uh, pesticide monitoring. So using them to monitor pesticides in the fields and, and seeing how, if there's runoff or exposure on playground equipment, for example. Okay. Now are, are any of those close to being, you know, out in the real world to apply and whatnot or? Yeah, we're working with a company um, to commercialize uh, some of the fertilizer ion sensors. Um, so we're getting there. Um, the, um, the pesticide sensors, I, th I think, are getting close. We, we need to team up with a commercial company there as well. And then the salmonella sensors, we have a startup company that we're working on, on commercializing those. So, so we're definitely keen on trying to you know, push this technology to, to that stage. Okay. And being at Iowa State, I'm, I'm sure that's the, uh, uh, the agriculture, the extension. Uh, do you work with those people, you know, ag, ag agents, extension agents, or, or professors and whatnot? Yep, ex yep, definitely. Uh, from time to time, some of the, the, the they can help us to see what what farmers actually need and help them get into like field trials and so forth, and just kind of the whole mission of the land grant university, you know, more applied science and applied technology, trying to meet the needs of of Iowans and 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 just people in general outside of the university. So there's definitely uh, encouragement to try to bring your research out of the lab and try to commercialize it. Okay. Have you partnered with any other states? I mean, I'm, I'm from Mississippi and uh, talk to a lot of extension people there quite often. I just wonder if, if there's a connection or to, to Mississippi or any other states. Yeah, we, we haven't, we haven't reached out to Mississippi. We definitely have um, some, so we actually have some, some collaborators in Hawaii who wants to want to test some of these uh, fertilizer ions sensors. That'd be a nice field trip. I know. I was hoping, <laughs> hoping that goes through. Yeah, honey, I'm going to be gone for six weeks. weeks. <laughs> I know. There, there's my summers. <laughs> um, um, yeah, and uh, definitely uh, in neighboring states such as Illinois, we've 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 had some some collaborations there. But we're we're definitely open for more collaborations. So if anyone would like to reach out, we'd be happy to to work with them. Okay, and uh, looking more at your at the Clausen is it the Clausen Lab? That's the proper name. Yeah, that I, that's kind of what we've called it. I, I haven't come okay. up with a, a new nifty name yet. Or yeah, I got to get like a $10 name, the Clausen Manufacturing Research <laughs> Graphene Nanotechnology something something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I guess so, yeah, how many people are, you know, are, do you work with or, or, or work under you or kind of, yeah. you know, is it really a, a large building that you guys have all these things in? Can people come visit or is there, are there a tour? I mean, with coronavirus, yeah. I'm sure that's not available at the moment, but. Yeah, a little bit difficult right now, but when we're fully open, for sure, um, we do have two, two kind of lab spaces, uh, one in the old chemistry building in Gilman, and then one in the biological engineering department, kind of a newer space. And, and that houses all our printing equipment, all, you know, the chemical fume hoods, um, uh, microscopes, and and potential stats that we'd, we'd use in other equipment to test um, these devices. Um, right now we have a, a, a postdoc working in our lab. We have six PhD students um, and three undergrads who are working full-time this summer, which are really doing a great job. And they've, they've, they're returning undergrads, so they really know their stuff. They're almost like graduate students. Um, so all of those undergrads and graduate students and postdocs I, I fund through through proposal money that, that that we've been awarded through federal agencies or commercial partners um, or foundations that that we've uh, we've we've been able to get money from. Okay, and I know there's a lot of graphene research, like in Australia and in the UK. Have, have any of those uh, people contacted you to to work or combine any projects or anything? We we haven't though there are some grants we've looked uh, NSF has some partnerships with the UK we might try to reach out to some of those partners uh, we do have some in Australia contact who is interested in some of our fertilizer ion sensors as well um, those are still kind of you know we haven't solidified those collaborations but we but we hope to yeah okay 
And uh, I guess looking at graphene, where do you see graphene going, graphene research, you know, real world applications? I guess, you know, everything is kind of wide open. Where right. do you, what, what, what's your view on it? You know, I, in definitely in the world of biosensors, what's great about it is, especially when you print it, it is so low cost. Um, and, and we can print it and, and do some post-processing on it, some annealing steps to make it just about as conductive as, as metal, uh, as if you were to print a silver ink, for example, and it's much more lower cost. So, and it's just carbon, so it's, it's bio-friendly, it's easy to put other biological agents on it, um, and, and it is disposable for the most part. So I really see it, you know, definitely in the food space, agricultural space, it's a nice sensor, you can, you can make a lot of them, and since it's so cheap, you could test a lot of different food products. And that's really the name of the game with, with food. You, you can't have a high cost biomedical sensor for food because it needs to be so inexpensive. So I, I see it as in, in those fields, uh, graphene would do quite well. Definitely if you need anything flexible um, or electrical circuits, like putting into clothing and so forth, graphene might be another good option. Um, so I, I think it's really could become, uh, you know, just a great material to replace a lot of the more rigid metal or silicon based um, s substrates that we commonly use for electronics. Okay, so is, is it easier and cheaper to work with, so to speak, or? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's definitely uh, in this form, in this printable form, just printing these flakes, it's, it's, it's a much cheaper uh, material than, than having to use a conventional noble metal. You know, even those diabetic test strips have a small gold, most of them have a small gold electrode in it to, to do your glucose monitoring at, at home. And, you know, even those could potentially be replaced with, with, with a carbon source that's cheaper like graphene. <clears throat> okay. And uh, is there anything about your lab or about graphene that I haven't covered that you would like to dive into or give us some information on? I think that's pretty good. Yeah, beyond beyond graphene, we've worked with some, a few other uh, nanomaterials. We we'll print telluride-based nanowires to, um, to to make these energy harvesters. So so trying to um, collect uh, heat um, and convert that into electricity that that could be useful. Um, so we have that going as well. But a lot of it is is the graphene and carbon-based uh, materials that we're working with. Okay. And, uh, and with your lab, I mean, are you looking for investors or looking for, I mean, you said you were looking for grants and those kind of things. I mean, can other businesses like invest in you or, you know, things yes, like that? Yes, absolutely. We always are. And we, we, we like to partner uh, with, with industry and work with them. Uh, a lot of times they will fund a student and they kind of get the opportunity to test drive a student. Um, they could um, see how that student is working. And a lot of times that student then will be hired by that company. Okay. Um, but then also we fill a need for that company that maybe they haven't looked into some of these materials or don't have the equipment that we have. And, and we have, you know, not only the equipment in our lab, but all the resources and equipment of the university that we can use on these projects. So I think it becomes kind of a win-win for, for both partners. Okay, great. Well, uh, wrapping up, I usually like to learn a little bit more about our guests. I mean, do you have any creative hobbies, any, anything that people don't know about you, you like to dance or cook or, you know, crochet, yeah. any, anything special? Yeah. Well, before the pandemic hit, I was avidly playing basketball about three times a week. Okay. Um, I do like, to, and, and playing soccer. Um, that's kind of stopped team sport. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um so right now i picked up running i run every other day and then i do like to cook so i'm i'm the one that does most of the cooking in our family as well. okay any any specialties or like the like baking frying broiling uh usually yeah so uh definitely uh frying and baking like different meats so i i, I do different uh slow cooking of, of pot roast to um iowa pork chops are great i sear them and then finish them off in the oven um, I have a good juicy chicken recipe that's oh. baked. Um, so yeah, and, and I do different fishes like salmon and cod. And so I, I yeah, I just try to learn a little bit each day. <laughs> okay. now, where, where, are you, where are you from originally? Are you from Minnesota or? I, I'm actually from Wisconsin originally. Okay. Yeah, Northern Wisconsin. Yep. Okay. So uh, probably grew up in a rural hunting fishing area or something or? It, it was. So it was in Wausau, Wisconsin. That's north central. And that's right before you get into the Northwoods where all the lakes are and so forth. So we definitely okay. went out to lakes and um, 
you know, did fishing and everyone was deer hunting. In fact, in our high school, you could get time off from high school to go deer hunting. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a big deal. I know here in Michigan, they, the, the, the union takes like the first day of deer hunting season off. They, they, they've got a, some name for it, but all the automaker, all the car guys head to the woods. So Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, Michigan's probably much like, you probably understand what it is to be mm, okay. uh, like country. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's all I have for today. Is there anything you'd like to add or wrap up with? I think that's it. Yeah, that was great. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Clausen, and good luck with your continued research. All right. Thanks so much, Mark.